Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves vessels for your use and yield now to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. And the saints said in agreement, Amen. 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 Satan, we bind you, all territorial spirits, all principalities, powers, rulers, wicked spirits in high places, territorials, elementals, and strong man spirits. All spirits not of the Holy Spirit, we're loosed, you're cast out. The saints said in agreement. Amen. Amen. Would you turn your beepers and cell phones off? Well, we are going to begin another part of our discussion on imaginings. We've been talking about the use of the imagination as a faculty of the soul life and what God's purpose for the imagination is. And we've spent several past sessions talking about the functions of the imaginations and we don't have time to review that, but if you're interested uh, in uh, the rest of the teaching, I would uh, recommend that you uh, get the CDs or the audio tapes uh, so that you could uh, catch up on the uh, uh, teaching. Most of what we are teaching uh, is dependent upon the previous foundations uh, of the uh, knowledge that you've heard beforehand. So you may not uh, totally understand all that we're talking about, but you can get the audio tapes or the CDs if you would like to uh, appreciate the whole teaching. It's an important teaching, and the reason it's important is because God uses the spirit-led uh, soul life or the spirit-led imagination, the redeemed imagination, that part of the faculty of the soul which is redeemed, to continue the process of the salvation of the soul, which is important in taking possession of your purpose in God. And so you can't understand the fullness of the work that God is doing in your life unless you understand and operate in these principles. Say, And that's why we bother to uh, study these things. But in our last discussion, we began an aspect of the study of the imagination, that faculty of the soul, which is creative or imagining, which is why we called this series Imaginings. And we started a discussion in our last session about uh, envisioning that aspect of the imagination which is related to uh, taking a vision to yourself. We discussed prior to that all the other aspects of imagination and how the Lord uses imaginations and what he had to say about imaginations in the scriptures and what the purposes of the imaginations were. But now when we talk about envisioning or having a vision, okay, we are talking about taking possession of something to yourself. And in particular, what we are talking about here is taking possession of God's purpose for your life for yourself, and not only God's purpose, but God's promises. Huh? Now, I don't know whether you know this, but there are over 800 promises of God in the Bible for you. Okay? And you can say, well, Bern, how can I find them? Well, it's very simple. You just read the Bible, and every time you see the word if, God follows it with a promise. Okay? So... That's the way you find the promises. Okay? But now let's talk about this business of envisioning. What does the word envision mean? We said last week that if you look in the dictionary, I, I looked in Merriam-Webster's, 
Okay, it says to picture to oneself. To picture to oneself. Well, obviously, then you need the imagination, don't you? So one of the functions of the imagination is to vision, to envision. And that is to picture to oneself and to picture to oneself something in particular in line with God's word, which is God's will. God's word is his will. And so, and by the way, it's also his standard, okay, which you and I cannot keep on our own. Hmm? We need Jesus, right? John 15, 5, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Huh? So he has to live his life in us and through us. And to bring the vision or the envisioning to fruition, to bring it to fullness, we have to understand that God is going to have to do it in us and through us, but he can't do it in us and through us if we don't have a vision to begin with. huh? And he'll even give you that. How's that? Say. And so there is a purpose for what God is doing, and there is a reason for what God is doing, and that reason and purpose is always His glory. Okay? Because you are living stones. We are living stones. And being such, God uses us to build the kingdom and to bring the kingdom to the earth to show others what the kingdom is. Say. That's the only way they're ever going to see that there's something greater. Okay? And so the purpose of the vision or envisioning is to picture to oneself, to bring something to oneself for God's purpose and God's glory. Okay? Now watch this. Proverbs 29, 18, which we quoted before, says, Where there is no vision the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, that's the word, he that keeps the word of God, happy is he. Okay? Notice how the first part of that verse started out. Without a vision, the people perish. And if you do a study of the Hebrew, the word for vision there in the Hebrew means a mental image. In other words, something that arises from the imagination. Say, you've got to have a vision. And your vision has to be in line with the leading of the Holy Spirit. You've got to connect because then there's a covenant. And where there's a covenant, there's a rhema. Amen. Huh? Did you get that? Where there's a covenant, there's a rhema revelation. Okay, so you've got to tap in to the vision by walking in the covenant. Okay? Now, if we understand that, okay, then there are some principles that we can follow, which are biblical, and these biblical principles that we can follow, okay, will take us to our purpose in God. Say. One of the worst things that can happen to us as Christians, okay, is leaning on our own understanding and in the process of leaning on our own understanding, missing out on God's purpose for our lives. I heard someone gasp. Okay, so without a vision, the scripture says, the people perish. Now, the word perish in the Hebrew means to suffer loss. doesn't mean to be destroyed. It means to suffer loss. Okay? So, you've got to have a vision. Say, I've got to have a vision. <laughs> That's right. Okay? Now... How do we get the vision? The vision is obtained through envisioning. How's that? So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be a Christian. <laughs> huh? Okay. And what is the purpose of envisioning? Well, five is the number of grace. Huh? Let me give you five purposes for having a vision or envisioning. One it provides hope. Two, 
it provides direction. Three, it provides purpose. Four, it provides goals. And five, it provides accomplishment. Say, it's through the vision that you have for your faith walk, for yourself, for your family, for your children, for your church, okay, that you achieve God's purpose. So there's a purpose in all of it. Okay? So five, hope, direction, purpose, goals, accomplishment. Five is the number of grace, isn't it? Say, the biblical number of grace. So God wants to give you grace. God wants to give you a vision, and you've got to tap into that vision And you've got to walk in the word and apply the word to that vision, that purpose that God is calling you to. And if you don't know what it is, just ask the Holy Spirit to show you and he'll show you. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Huh? See, God has a way of doing it. So, watch this. If you can see it, In line with God's word, which is his will, you can have it. If you can see it, you can have it. But guess what? You can't do it. Wow. You can't do it by yourself, that is. If you see it, you can have it, huh? Okay, can I show you that in the Word? Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I can. See? I can't do it alone, but I can do it through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Huh? I can. Miracles come in cans. Amen. Okay? I can do it. All right? Mark 10, 27 says, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So God's a possibility God. Hmm? God's a God of possibilities. Okay? And if you have the vision, God has the possibility. Okay, and if you back that vision with faith, God has the probability. See, that went over some people's heads. (laughs) You think about it. (laughs) Holy Spirit will give you the revelation. Okay, so what does this mean? If you can see it in line with God's word and will, you can have it. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. In other words, the condition is changed by your vision. Did you get that? The condition, the circumstance is changed by your vision. Okay? What is your vision? Okay. How many of you know that you can change things in your life? Did you know that? And what is it that changes things in your life? Faith and faith confession. We say faith confession brings possession. Faith confession brings possession. Right? So, if you want to change your life, you've got to have a different vision. And you've got to take it to yourself. If you want to change your circumstances, you've got to have a different vision and you've got to take it to yourself because faith confession brings possession, which means that you've got to stop talking the problem and start talking the solution. You've got to get rid of the stinking thinking, okay, and start talking the solution, okay, because God's a possibility God, say, 
God is a God of possibilities. Everything with God, the scripture says, is yes, yes, and amen. Huh? Anything line that, is, uh, that lines up with his word and will huh? is yes, yes, and amen. And so you have to understand how to operate in these principles, apply them to your life, because it's biblical application that brings transformation. See? You could read the Bible all day long. You can memorize it. You can quote it. But if you don't apply it, nothing will happen. See? Because it's faith, application, that brings it down. See? See? Faith is the bridge between the spirit realm and the earthly realm, isn't it? Scripture says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things you don't have yet that's here on the earth. <clears throat> faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things that you're hoping for here on the earth, the evidence of things unseen. Well, the word evidence in the Greek of the New Testament means the guarantee of things unseen. That's in the spirit realm, huh? So you have the substance of things hoped for in the earthly realm. You have the evidence of things unseen in the spirit realm, and faith is the bridge. Faith is what pulls it down from the spirit to the earthly. See? And so if you got a vision, okay, that purpose and that intent of God for your life in line with his word, you can pull it down by faith. Huh? Faith is what makes it happen. In other words. Say faith, faith makes it happen. Glory to God. Okay? So the condition is changed by your vision. That's why God gave you envisioning as a faculty of the imagination. See, you've got to be able to see things the way God sees things. See? The Bible says there's always a way out. There's always a way of escape. God makes the way of escape. Huh? That means that God is a God of possibilities and there's always a way out. Say, God does it. And all you have to do is move with him because you're in covenant with him. Huh? You're in covenant with him. Okay? So envisioning is the stuff that lives are built on. Whether you realize it or not. Okay? Envisioning is the stuff that your spirituality is built on because you have an idea, you have a vision of the kind of a relationship that you want with God and how you want to walk with Jesus. Huh? Envisioning is the stuff that your life is built on not only spiritually but physically. Huh? Okay? Let me tell you something. I once weighed 248 pounds, and I had seven heart operations, okay? And I can tell you this, that I did not have a vision of myself as a healthy person, and I was a doctor. Can you imagine doctoring people? I couldn't even take care of myself. Okay? okay? And that was always a concern for me, okay, because I come from a family of undertakers, <laughs> okay, and in my, I have relatives that are undertakers, and, and there are four of these guys lurching in the, <laughs> in the background, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. In fact, my son-in-law's one, and, and I, I tell people that Eric's the last guy who'll ever let you down. <laughs> uh, okay, but listen, I had a different vision. I wasn't ready to go, and I wasn't ready to leave the world. Okay, and my vision, my physical life, had to be changed by my vision. See, and I had to start. I weighed two hundred forty-eight pounds, but I needed to lose weight. And I had to start seeing myself thinner. 
I had to start envisioning myself as being able to do it. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who comforts me. And after I went in for my seventh heart procedure, I said to the cardiologist, this has to stop. I said, I can't keep doing this. For the last seven years, I've had my annual heart operation. I mean, you know, this has to stop. Okay. And, you know, what can I do about it? You know, and he said to me, you need a lifestyle change. Say, you know, the scripture says the sons of darkness are wiser than the sons of light. Huh? Isn't that something? Okay. He's ministering to me. Uh, and uh, I don't have a witness of the spirit. He's yet saved, but he's going to be. And uh, he said to me, you need a lifestyle change. But see, a lifestyle change cannot be had, cannot be received without a vision, okay? If you don't see yourself as a better person, if you don't see yourself as a healed person, if you don't see yourself as a transformed person, if you don't see yourself walking in divine health, you're not going to be. It's as simple as that. And God is going to keep you there until you decide to change your attitude and your frame of mind. Okay? God is going to keep you there until you have a different attitude. See? And it all begins with a change of attitude. If you want to grab the vision, you've got to have a change of attitude, and it's got to be an I can do attitude. Because that's what the Word says. See? And if you don't do that, God will keep you right there until you decide to move. See, most of us are always waiting for God to make a move. God's waiting for you to make a move. See? And so when you understand how the kingdom operates, remember what we said? The kingdom is granted by grace, demonstrated, or I mean, taken possession of by faith, demonstrated by action. you got to take an action, then God will demonstrate the kingdom to you. So if you want an answer to prayer, you got to pray first. You've got to take an action. If you want to see a healing, you got to lay hands first. You've got to take an action. So action precedes manifestation of the kingdom. So if you want to see the kingdom operate, you've got to do those things. And so envisioning is the stuff that lives are built on spiritually. Envisioning is the stuff that lives are built on physically. Okay? And envisioning is the thing that lives are built on socioeconomically. Okay? The world knows envisioning. Okay? And people who practice it, the world calls them go-getters. Hmm? Okay? So the world knows what envisioning is. See? The enemy knows what envisioning is. Okay? And he wants you to envision the wrong things. Okay? And if you do that, you'll get the wrong result and you'll end up with the wrong purpose. Huh? Okay? So the scripture says, by this we know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. See, there's two major spirits operating in the world. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay? And whichever one you line up your vision with will be the one that will lead you. The Holy Spirit is all too willing to accommodate you. And guess what? The spirit of error is all too willing to accommodate you. Say. So it's all a matter of who you tune into and how you tune in and how you're going to walk your faith walk. Say. So envisioning is the stuff that makes your spiritual life possible, your physical life possible, your socioeconomic life possible. Okay? But to pursue the vision, watch this, you must have understanding. And that understanding must come from God's Spirit alone. 
Did you get that? Okay. To pursue the vision, you must have understanding. Watch this. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs 2 1 and read on. My son, if you will receive my words and hide my commandments with you, so that you incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as your hid treasures, then shall you understand the fear of the Lord, that means the awe of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom out of his mouth, comes knowledge and understanding. He lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keeps the paths of judgment and preserves the way of his saints. Then shall you understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yes, every good path. When wisdom enters into your heart and knowledge is pleasant unto your soul, discretion shall preserve you, understanding shall keep you, to deliver you from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaks forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. So understanding is the key by which you pursue the vision to bring God's purpose into your life to its fullness. Okay, and so he talks here about understanding and knowledge. And then if you turn to Psalm 119, notice what the psalmist says in verse 34, Psalm 119, 34. He says, give me understanding and I will keep your law. That's the word of God. How will you keep the word of God? Through understanding. See, how will you pursue the vision? Through understanding. How will you grab God's purpose for your life? Through understanding. Okay? I shall observe it with my whole heart, he says. And then in verse 73 of the same psalm, he says, Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. In verse 99, the psalmist says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. In um, in verse 104, he says, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. See, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. So if you hate every false way and you stand on the precepts of God, it will take you to his purpose for you. Can you see that? Okay. The key is the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of good counsel, the spirit of wisdom the spirit of fear, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Okay? And so the psalmist cries out in the same psalm, and verse 144, Your righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting, giving me understanding and I shall live. See, it's pursuit of your vision through understanding and revelation that you will live, that you will carry out God's purpose for your life, and that is life. See, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life, and that you may have life abundantly. Say abundantly. 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 Say.
And so we've got to operate in the spirits of God. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, we all know that that was Jesus. Huh? And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Those are the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit, seven manifestations of God's one spirit. And so we understand in all of this that what this is doing is showing us that we must operate in these aspects of the Holy Spirit and permit the Holy Spirit to minister those things to us. huh? And when we get understanding, okay, we can grasp the vision. When we get understanding, we can move in the vision. The vision will bring us to the fullness of God's purpose for our lives. See? So in envisioning, we take something to ourselves. And the something that we take to ourselves is God's purpose for us. Okay? So that we can glorify Him. Okay? And you can't do that without a covenant, can you? You've got to be a born-again, spirit-filled, redeemed Christian huh? in order for that to happen. Okay? So for the vision to manifest to completion, Jesus must do it. He must live it in you and through you. Huh? So Galatians 2.20 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Huh? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10 says, His life, my body. John says, I must decrease that he may increase. Paul says, I die daily. Huh? Okay. In other words, the, the vision is carried out, okay, by us decreasing, by letting Christ live his life in us through us. So understanding means he's got to do it in us and through us. We have to be yielded empty vessels. Okay? We've got to be cracked pot. Huh? Cracked pot. You know, the Old Testament talks about the cracked cistern, the broken cistern. That's a cracked pot. So you've got to be a cracked pot for Jesus. Say, Now what is it about a cracked pot? Okay, a cracked pot is always empty because it won't hold water. Huh? Okay. The water just flows from a cracked pot. Water in Scripture represents the Word of God. Hmm? So a, a cracked pot is a believer who's an empty vessel. Can't hold the water. All he does is pour it out. Pours out the Word of God to others. Can you see that? Okay. So if you're going to grab the vision, okay, you've got to be an empty vessel. There's only one way you can be an empty vessel. Okay. Paul confesses, I die daily. People say to me, what does God want out of me? I tell them, he wants you dead. <laughs> huh? Yeah. What do you mean he wants me dead? Just what I said, he wants you dead. He wants you dead to self. See? You know? He doesn't want your ministry. I don't have a ministry. I don't know about this, whether you people know it. Yeah. This was never this was never named Burns and Pano ministry. This was named Word of Faith ministry. Right from the beginning. Okay? Why? Because I didn't think there was anything in Burns and Panel that could be a ministry. Amen. See? A lot of people name ministries after themselves. Is that biblical? Yes. It's biblical. Scripture says don't hide your light under a bushel. Okay. But I chose not to. Why? Because I don't have anything to offer you. Only Jesus in me has something to offer you. Amen. See? 
And so, you see, when you come here on a Sunday morning, you're looking at a possessed man. I don't know whether you know this. See? I'm possessed. See? I don't know whether you know that or not, but I'm possessed. You know, the church talks about, uh, talks about demonic possession. Demonic possession, like I told you before, is just the counterfeit of the real. Huh? Okay? If you're really possessed, you're possessed by Jesus, by Jesus' Holy Spirit. Okay? So if you're an empty vessel, He'll talk through you. Okay? And He'll bring you to levels of revelation that you didn't know existed. Yes. Say. Okay? So Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Okay? So what that means is that for the vision to manifest to completion, Jesus must do it. He must live it in you and through you. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.10, his life, my body. Paul says, I'm possessed. That's what he meant by that. I'm possessed, Paul says. Say. So if you have a vision and you are envisioning God's purpose for your life, then the next step is you've got to run with it. What good is a vision that you don't run with? Huh? What are you going to do? Sit home and think about the vision? Oh, what a nice vision. You see? Look at the pretty vision. You see? And do nothing with it? Huh? Step out in faith and watch God work. See? You can't do it, but God can do it through you. Huh? Okay? So the next thing is you've got to run with the vision. Okay? You must run forward only. Ah. See? In other words, the envisioning, the vision has to have direction. Okay? And that direction with God is one way only. Forward. Forward. You all remember the song, No Turning Back, No Turning Back? Yes. Huh? Yes. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. So your vision has to have direction. See? You must be sure it's from Jesus. Okay? A lot of people get ideas they want to go out and do great things for God. Guess what? God doesn't need your help. There's no such thing as going out and doing great things for, for God. That doesn't exist. Okay? The whole purpose of the Christian faith walk is to know Him. That's the purpose of the Christian faith walk. If you miss that, you miss everything. Miss that and you miss out on God's purpose for your life. That's why you need the understanding. That's why you need the revelation. That's why you need the seven spirits of God. Say, because it's through grasping the vision and bringing it to yourself that you get the purpose, okay? And that purpose is always to know him. Not just to carry out a work for him, but to know him first and foremost. And when you grab that, okay, your faith walk gets deeper and deeper. Okay, if you're the same Christian today that you were five years ago and you are doing the same thing over and over and over again, okay, you need formation in Christ. Okay, why? Because the scripture says of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says in the scripture, behold, I am doing a new thing. Amen. Holy Spirit is always doing something new in you and through you. 
Okay? If you're doing the same thing over and over, okay, that you were doing years ago, okay, or even last year, okay, you're missing out on what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do and you need discipleship. Simple as that. Say, you need to park in a church where you will get fed not only the Word of God, but the ways of God. Okay, the ways of God are as important as God's Word. Huh? Okay? And so you've got to understand that you've got to move with His vision for you. Not your vision for yourself, but His vision for you. See? Okay? And then you have to understand that that involves surrender, doesn't it? Okay? Okay? So you need confirmation. And how do you get the confirmation? Two ways. The multitude of witnesses. That's Old Testament. All right. And two or three witnesses. That's New Testament. Huh? Let a fact be established in a multitude of counselors. Okay. Then it says, let, uh, uh, that's Old Testament. Okay. And then in the New Testament it says, let a fact be established through two or three witnesses. Say. Okay, so you've got to understand how God operates in these things so that you can move with them. Okay, so envisioning in line with God's word, backed by faith and confidence, pursued steadfast without wavering, brings the result. Watch this. It says in James 1, verse 6 and 7, Let him who doubts not believe he'll receive anything from the Lord, for the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Huh? Unstable in all of his ways. So if you're not steadfast, if you're not sticking to it, that's called stick to Steadfast. Okay? <laughs> okay, when you're steadfast, okay, that's when God will move. But when you're wavering in your faith, okay, that's when God won't move. See? And so the first thing is, it says, for let him who doubt not believe he'll receive anything from the Lord. So, if you're going to grab the vision and God's purpose for you and you're going to be used by God and take it to yourself, everything in the kingdom you have to take to yourself. You know that? Huh? How'd you get salvation? You said, I want that, and you took it to yourself, didn't you? The whole kingdom operates that way. You want a healing? you got to take it to yourself. You want deliverance? You've got to take it to yourself. See? You've got to confess it with your mouth. Faith confession brings possession, the scripture says. huh? Faith confession brings possession. And so the first thing, notice what it says. Okay, let him who doubts not believe he'll receive anything from the Lord. So we back it by faith. And then the scripture says, we go from faith to faith, glory to glory. Huh? Now what does that mean? Testing to testing, victory to victory. Say, with every testing, with every testing comes, the victory. comes the victory. And I take it to myself. And I take it to myself. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. 100%. 100%. In, the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's my vision. That's my vision. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. To, the to the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, we go from faith to faith, glory to glory, steadfast, without wavering. That's what brings the result, the scripture says. Huh? Are y'all with me? Okay. So, what will manifest it? The understanding. Okay? The revelation, the knowledge, the wisdom, the spirit of might, the spirit of good counsel. 
okay, etc. The seven spirits of the Holy Spirit that we pursue by letting the Holy Spirit divinely possess us and live his life in us and through us, okay? So understanding comes when we walk as Jesus walked, which is in righteousness and faithfulness, okay? So understanding is the door to envisioning. Say understanding, understanding is the door, is the door to, envisioning. to envisioning. When I understand what the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, when I understand what the Word of God is saying to me, when I understand what the Spirit's trying to communicate to me, and I act on that, I can grab the vision. And I can bring that vision to myself. And I can walk in that vision. And I can be whole in that vision. Okay. So understanding is the door to envisioning. And righteousness, watch this. Righteousness and faithfulness are the hinges on which the door hangs, on which the door moves, on which the door opens. Did you get that? You want me to say it again? Understanding comes when we walk as Jesus walked, which is in righteousness and faithfulness. Guess what? We don't have any of our own. Righteousness and faithfulness is imputed to us by the blood of Jesus and the finished work of the cross. So we've got to be born again, and we've got to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, once we do that, the Holy Spirit opens up our understanding, okay? And that righteousness and faithfulness are the hinges of the door that's opened to us, which is the door of understanding, see? Because we can only understand the righteousness and faithfulness of Christ imputed to us by the spirit of understanding. Huh? He's got to give us the understanding. And once he gives us the understanding, we can walk in that and apply it to our life. Okay? Now that's important. Why is it important? Because with understanding comes revelation. And guess who the revelation is? Revelation is a person. And his name is Jesus. Huh? Say with understanding. Comes revelation. And revelation is a person. And his name is Jesus. Oh boy. Bear with me. We're coming to the end shortly. Okay. Now watch this. Revelation comes through a pure heart and clean hands. Revelation comes from standing on the hill of the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Huh? The Psalms also say, Who can stand on the hill of the Lord except he who has a pure heart? In clean hands. So firstly we need a pure heart and clean hands. Which is imputed to us by the blood of Christ. Because we don't have any of our own. Huh? That's a work of transformation being done in us. And in our soul life. By the Holy Spirit. Huh? And we've got to let the Lord do it in us and through us. And build the house through our understanding. Hello. Am I in the right church? Yes. Okay, so watch this now. Watch how it comes. Revelation comes through a pure heart and clean hands. That's being born again. His blood, his cleansing imputed to us. Okay, revelation comes by standing on the hill of the Lord. Who can stand on the hill of the Lord except he who has a pure heart and clean hands? And you stand on the hill of the Lord... Watch this. The hill of the Lord is where the anointing is. 
Huh? Okay. The anointing is where the power is. Okay. The power is where the spirit is. Okay. And where the spirit is, the revelation is. Huh? Okay. So if the spirit is the spirit of revelation, okay, guess what? Revelation comes by standing on the hill of the Lord and the revelation brings the rhema and the revelation is the rhema. Are you with me? Okay. And guess what the word rhema means in Greek? The happening. The envisioning. The happening of the thing you envision. Hello. Y'all looking puzzled. Uh, Stop that. Just grab it and run with it. Huh? Okay. How did that all happen? Let's go back one more time. Let's go through it one more time quickly. Okay. With understanding comes revelation. When I have a pure heart and clean hands, when I am born again, standing on the hill of the Lord, where the anointing is. The anointing empowers me, huh? So I can grasp the understanding. With the understanding comes the revelation. With the revelation comes the rhema. The revealed word behind the written word. The the revelation is the rhema. The rhema is first and foremost a person, and his name is Jesus. Huh? And with the rhema, because the word rhema means the happening, okay, there is the actualization of the vision. Okay? The happening is there. I got my purpose in Jesus. Huh? Okay? But notice, to do it, you've got to stand on the hill of the Lord... Okay, and faith confession brings possession. Why? Because words are spiritual. See, your faith activates it all. Because words are spiritual. As a matter of fact, did you know that the Bible refers to words as spirituals? That's what the Bible calls words, spirituals. Isn't that something? See, the ancients had a concept that words were spiritual. Huh? See? So they so the Holy Spirit through them called words spirituals. See? Okay? Faith filled words. Okay? So spirituals bring it down from the heavenly realm to the earthly realm, and that's called a faith confession. Huh? And so we say faith confession brings possession. Huh? Okay. So the envisioning is taken to oneself, is released, is put in motion by releasing spirituals, by releasing words, faith-filled words from your mouth. See? If you don't talk faith, and if you don't talk faith-filled words from your mouth, you can't get anything from God. Because God's a faith God. See? So you've got to have something to say. Huh? Now watch this. So the envisioning is taken to oneself, released, put in motion, by releasing faith-filled words of understanding and revelation, standing on faith and righteousness. Faith and righteousness are a person, and his name is Jesus, and he is called in the scripture, the rock. Okay? Now, we said earlier that the requirement is to be and walk in the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit, the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. 
In other words, you've got to grasp the understanding. You've got to grasp the revelation. You've got to grasp the wisdom and all the other aspects of the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit and apply them to your vision, okay, that God reveals to you, which is your purpose in Him. First and foremost, to know Him. So you've got to be born again. Huh? You've got to come to the rock. See? And you've got to stand on the rock. See? That's the hill of the Lord. Okay? Now, if you understand that, that means one thing. To take possession of the vision, you've got to be redeemed. Huh? So the whole purpose of the process and uh, of the redemption and the process of the redemption, okay, is to bring you to your fullness of your purpose in Christ. And Christ did it all for you, right? Okay. That is the redemption or the redemptive power of the work of the cross, isn't it? Where Christ purchased the kingdom for you to bring the kingdom to you, okay, by paying the price on the cross. See, religious people always talk about the cross, the cross, the cross, okay, there's even a song, the old rugged cross, okay? That's religious stuff, okay? Yuck. It isn't the cross. It's the work of the cross. It's the work that Jesus did on the cross that's important, not the cross. The cross was an instrument of torture and a cursed object that was created by Semiramis, queen of Babylon, to torture her uh, subjects who opposed her husband, King Nimrod. See? It wasn't the cross that was important. It was the work of the cross. See? And people say, Jesus went to the cross and he hung on the cross for you. And that's the redemption. I got to tell you something, folks. That's witchcraft. They got it backwards. Okay? They got it backwards. Okay? Jesus did not go to the cross. Okay? In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I lay my life down of my own account. Nobody crucified Jesus. The Romans didn't crucify Jesus. The Jews didn't crucify or kill Jesus. Jesus said very clearly, I lay my life down of my own account. Listen to this, folks. Jesus did not go to the cross. The cross went to Jesus. Amen. Do you understand that? He says, I laid down my life of my own account. I've got a work to do. And that cross came to him so he could do the work. Amen. Amen. It works just backwards from what the church is teaching. Okay? Jesus doesn't hang on the cross. The cross hangs on Jesus. <coughs> do you understand this? Okay? Everything that is done regarding the work of the cross hangs on Jesus. He's the one who does the work of the cross. Okay? Let me tell you something about a cross. A cross can't stand up without a rock. It's a rock that holds a cross up. The cross is nothing without Jesus. The cross is nothing without the work of Jesus. Okay? 
Jesus is the redemption. Jesus is the revelation. And the revelation brings the understanding, and that is the transformation. Okay? A cross can't stand without a rock, and neither can you or I. We all need a rock, and his name is Jesus. Okay? So we need to get our doctrine straight. And we need to understand that it is the redemptive work of the cross that Jesus did when Jesus took that cross to himself. He said, I have a work to do. Okay? I have need of that. Okay? In fact, the scripture says it was decided before the creation. Say. I have need of that. Say, people say Jesus had to hang on the cross. No, the cross had to hang on Jesus. Say, it was Jesus and his work, okay, that made the cross possible. So the cross had to hang on Jesus. Huh? And the cross could never stand up Okay, without a rock. And Jesus is the rock. Get it? Okay. Now that redemptive power of the work of the cross, okay, is what opens up the gates of heaven. Okay. And when the gates of heaven are open, there's a vision. Say, and God... Once we are redeemed by that work of the cross, God shows us the vision. He shows us our purpose by our reliance on him, by being an empty vessel, letting him infill us. Okay? Why? Because he is the spirit of revelation. He is the spirit of understanding. He is the spirit of good counsel to lead you in the direction that you should go. Say and the decisions that you should make. He is the spirit of wisdom. He is the spirit of power and might. Okay? He is the spirit of knowledge. Say. And all of these things, through the redemptive power of the cross, okay, bring the kingdom to the earth. Okay, and you are called to be the revelation of the kingdom to an unbelieving world. Say, and you cannot do that successfully unless you grasp the vision. Say, unless you run with the vision, unless you grasp God's purpose for your life, unless you understand that. God is always doing a new thing and you've got to be doing a new thing too. Amen. Or you're not moving with God's Amen. spirit. Say. Okay? Because that's the way to be church. See, God doesn't call you to play church. God calls you to be church. huh? And how do you be church? You move with God's spirit because the church is a living organism of living stones called believers. Say, The church is not some little organization. Word of faith here is not the church. Huh? Okay? Those are not churches. Churches are living organisms of believers. Okay? That bring a living revelation to others. That bring living understanding to others. Okay? That bring living possibilities to others. Okay? That bring hope in the future to others. And a message to others. Okay, you can have what I have. God's not a respecter of persons. Huh? Okay, but you've got to grasp the vision. And you've got to bring the vision to yourself. Say, so envisioning as part of the function of the imagination is God's way of saying to you and to me, you can have whatever you can imagine in line with my will and my word. Say, 
But you've got to take it to yourself by faith and you've got to run with it and you've got to walk in it. Okay? And there is no limit to the possibilities of where God can bring you because there is no limit to His revelations. His revelations reflect Him and He is infinite. See? So He is a God of infinite possibilities, Sister Josie. Yeah. Did you know that? Yes, yeah. sir. He is a God of infinite possibilities. Say, And all you've got to do is enter into His rest and move with God's Spirit. Set your attitude. Set your will. Okay? Pursue Him. Okay? And He will pursue you. That's the scripture that says, Draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. Huh? Guess who's got to make the first move? He says, you draw near unto me. See, you've got to make the first move. huh? And then I'll draw near unto you. Say, okay? Amen. 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 Give the Lord glory.